Well, you're in for a good time tonight because he is returning for second time on this podcast. Please welcome my guest, Thomas Mackey. Mm -hmm. And today we're actually not going to talk about historical events. We're going to talk about what does it take to become a historian and what did, how does the historians document modern history? What does it require to become a historian? And thank you for returning to this podcast. Thank you much. <laughs> so I, let's just start. And uh, I think we asked wh why you chose Abraham Lincoln in the previous episode. But I want oh. to know, why did you choose to become a historian <laughs> in the first place? I had a uh, lady, a mother of a little boy, about really, really bright year old, six year old kid. And he was in my museum gallery. And mom had asked me, says, well, Mr. Mackey, when, when, when did you first love history? Because she was... This poor mom and dad had not finished high school. Like, I don't think they finished middle school. Yeah. Um, they were from East, Eastern Tennessee, um, in the outback. And this um, dear lady was really concerned that she couldn't raise this boy because he was smart. You know, she's noticed that. A lot of questions, really curious. Says, well, Mr. Mackey, when did you start realizing you love history? I says, before I was four. Mm. <laughs> My early, one of my earliest childhood memories is in the Canada, old Fort Henry. And I remember the tour. I wasn't wow. four years old yet. I remember being able to identify a British uniform from the War of 1812. Wow. You know, and the Union Jack is my grandparents. That's my grandparents' flag. I, you know, I was thinking of that. So there are things you just love to do. Um, I, I grew up in the, you know, the American school system, which Americans starting out with, we're very ambivalent about history. We do yeah. not do it well as a culture. We don't live with it. Our history is fairly thin by European and Asian standards, as you might imagine. Um, yeah, we, we tease um, in, in Britain, uh, I had family over there, um, 200 miles is a long distance. In the US, it's nothing. 200 yeah. years is a long time in the US, and Britain is nothing, you know? Yeah. Uh, so you, you had this this difference between us. So the Americans have always been, you know, I, I say Lincoln, this came up there. This, we're very ambivalent about um, historical things. We just don't particularly do it well. Um, at least we don't think about it in the same way I think other countries have. Yeah. But I started, because I, it was just a curious uh, interest of mine. I loved, I saw things in the past, right? Particularly objects. And that was my favorite resource for history was objects. Um, yeah. Either landscapes, buildings, um yeah um, yeah i agree that was you, my interest area you have some fantastic archaeological buildings ancient buildings that you mm -hmm. can it just when you near them you feel the you feel the past you yeah. can, when you touch on these buildings mm -hmm. like when right. i was in coliseum and i was walking oh, down mm -hmm. on the coliseum and i was just touching the walls i was feeling the history mm -hmm. of coliseum so yeah i know what i mean that's a very powerful tool, which is why museums are such a good teachers, because the objects really emotionally prepare you to learn something. Actually, because you can't touch things is, in the museums. <laughs> that's right. Um, I remember at Lincoln's home, my dean, the dean I worked with, and she was not inclined to be historically conscious <laughs> at all. But in Lincoln's home, there was this packet door, and all of a sudden, it just hit her. This is the same packet door that Lincoln and Mary closed when they had company yeah you, know, you know this was their door it would not been changed yeah. in 160 years 170 years they were in that house and that emotionally hit her and it hit me again and i realized even as jaded as i might get sometimes in all these years that is still a very powerful i can't forget that that yeah. is a very strong emotional link therefore i must be very careful that when i use words to describe or fill out the story that the object starts, I've got to make sure I'm as honest as I know to be. I've got to be very careful that I've done the service. You know, yeah. I had one boss one time who, uh, again, had no historical grasp of the world at all, um, no interest whatsoever. And I was fussing over something and marketing was doing. And he says, Tom, you're the only one who's going to know about it. It's right or wrong. I said, you're right. And I'm going to know it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and everybody who talks to me, they're going to assume that what I said to the best of my ability is truth or is truthful. Wow, that's powerful. I'm not going to know everything. I'm going to be, there is a flaw to knowledge. However, 
I'm going to be as honest as I know. And that, mm. and that, and, and so there's an ethic that has driven my career to the point of being a rather um, uh, disturbing to some people who want to make it easier. <laughs> So right. I get called ornery sometimes. <laughs> right. Um, if you want to become a historian, I think this is more for if I'm, for my American listeners. Mm -hmm. um, what what does it require to become a historian? What what is the what would the best tools for education okay. become oh. if you want to become a historian, especially in the U.S.? It often depends on what you mean by historian. Do you mean, for example, I on an academic out, level? Well, okay, academic level is different than a public historian. Public historian, in fact, a lot of academics are doing both, but for an academic historian, and there's so few anymore left, or at least jobs left, that's we've been eating this, um, the system down to nothing. Um, years ago, E. Halak Carr wrote a book called What is History? And to be a historian, he had claimed you must have at least postgraduate, some postgraduate work, um, which means a master's plus. Yeah. Uh, and this was back, oh goodness, 80 years ago. Um, with the ease of getting through a lot of programs, with the sheer volume of programs, a lot of schools, having a history of PhD is almost essential just to get anything done. Um, it's so you, you go through an awful lot of work uh, for sometimes part time jobs, but it's because. Um, is it difficult uh, to get into a historical academy or? Depending is it... on the school. Um, I went to actually very simple schools. Um, my undergrad years. Is uh, was that's Spring Arbor, which is a free Methodist school, um, a college at that. But I had a very good opening instructors, a very good philosophy of history, very good philosophy of life. Um, Eastern Michigan, again, a small school, but it was in, it, again, I wasn't planning on being an academic historian. I wanted to be a public historian. Yeah. What's the difference? I did not want to teach. I was terrified of teaching. Yeah. The very thought of teaching scared the bejeebers out of me. There's no, 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 no. I don't want to teach. So I wanted to work in museums. I wanted yep. to work with objects and people. I, I liked the people. I enjoyed doing tours. Heritage interpret, that's what I wanted to do. And you really only need a master's for that. But as I worked in museums as a director, the CEO of a museum, I realized I didn't have the chops to analyze, constantly analyze new stories, to really grasp into a community. The problem is a lot of history is very thin. And that's because you don't really have the chops to dig in and find the larger volume of sources and do a lit, what you call a lit search. This is digging in and finding everything somebody has written, other people have written about a similar subject or topic yeah. area. Well, that requires, you know, the databases, you, read, you know, uh, other authors. It's, it's a huge amount of pre-knowledge just to start work. And that's what the PhD does. It gets you to the point where you know who's written on what. Yeah. Um, you're familiar with all of the readings. And in, here in the U.S., we have um, a right wing politically and, and um, socially tends to denigrate um, history in general, although they honor it, but they don't know how to do it. Yeah. You have many who they, they use sources, but don't actually grasp that. I can't just dive in and read let sources and expect to come up with something right away. Um, friends of mine who have done this even after the PhD level. They've spent decades sometimes reading certain things like, if they're a political historian, they've spent decades reading uh, things like the Federalist Papers, letters of Thomas Jefferson, or um, any of the, the members of the Constitution Convention, um, their private diaries, their journals, their letters, memos, network, you know, um, the, the, the uh, references from a custodian who lived nearby, you know, um, you know, you spend a, you spend years just wading through this stuff. Yeah, that's when you start becoming. But then, see, history is not simply um, the past itself. History is actually how do I reconstruct the past from all these little bits and pieces that I've spent years diving into. Um, I've got fiber topics that I don't write on because I'm not sure what it means. I'm not sure if I can say anything about it that's worth saying. Yeah. Um, when you um, start diving into this material, um, you just, you, it, after a while, you start reading it, realizing, oh, here's a pattern. And what you're doing is you're seeking some kind of pattern, some kind of stories that evolve out of your research. And it, it does not, it is, it's not quick. It's, it is, 
for many people, it's not useful because it takes too long. Yeah. It's um, difficult. So to get back to your question, to be a historian, um, if you want to call yourself a historian, you do need the graduate degree. Um, you need some kind of, and I know I, I encourage my students, I want you to be, if you want to be an amateur historian, meaning I'm not going to make my living at it because there's so few jobs out there. I might yeah. be in a corporate world, I might, maybe I'll do hedge funds, maybe I'll do, you know, I, you pick, a, pick, a, pick a topic. But if I want to really become involved in history, then I usually I'm, I'm attached to a museum. And the easiest for us, if you're not an academic, is to be attached to a large museum. Yeah. Either as a volunteer, as an associate, um, and you're doing research. I, I, you know, a good writer isn't necessarily always paid all the time to be a writer. They might do a lot of writing um, and in time they'll get published. Yeah. They're still a writer, but that may not be what they make all their living at. Yeah. If I make it the kitchen. The history is, is a similar way. Um, it's a way of looking at the world. It's not just an occupation. It's a way of grasping what, how do I make sense of what's going on in the world right now even. It's a yeah. way of thinking about uh, the politics. I look at the elections in Europe, in America, um, Canada, um, Asia. You know, it's how you piece these things together. I'm using the past as a tool to think about the present. So um, we use this term history repeat would repeat itself, but why why is it important don't we want history to repeat itself? Why I think why, well, that, why why is that important the term? Well we use the term um that's kind of an old uh song about history repeats itself. I think because we're still human. We we can go back a thousand years plus and if you really dig into somebody's life if you can, if you can find enough database you can realize oh <laughs> i think i know what he's feeling right I, i think i know what she was doing yeah um means we're still human there, there, and there is this sense that a deja vu we've done this before however um there is a um there are five c's in history it's, it's kind of a new de 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 mnemonic device to help and i still like using it now um and how do i look at the past but one of them is that there's change over time despite the fact that history rhymes, as Mark Twain yeah. said. I mean, there are, oh, this sounds awfully, terribly familiar. I don't like this, um, but it's not the same. Yeah. There are change of change. The circumstances have changed. Yeah. The different players have changed. There's similar, you know, we're dealing with a plague again, but the circumstances yeah. have changed. The technology has changed. Um, the political infrastructures involved have changed and i want to ask you about this because I, we discussed this briefly in my drunk history episode as well i don't know mm -hmm. if you listen to that but we, we don't kind of see history repeat itself like the spanish flu where, where people don't play especially and like how the, so the british and american government and so yeah. many <laughs> many other governments have downplayed this play yeah. and don't we see history kind of repeat itself in this sense yeah We have, yeah, and, and, and those are, in, in America particularly, I can't say much in Europe, I don't know it as well, but America, we do have these um, two general overarching themes of who we are. They're self-identity yeah. things. One is, okay, what kind of nickname the Hamiltonian? Um, it's a little more elitist, that there is a, um, a need for greater order And another one is the need for greater um, openness. You know, more and more people need to be involved if a democracy is actually to work. You need to get everybody involved because you can't possibly can. You need to maximize your number of voters. Um, and we still have this battle right now. We have sides that want to restrict the number of voters versus those who want to expand the number of voters. Yeah. Um, That those are that's something we have dealt with from the very beginning, and we're as you watch our news, we're still dealing with that one. So that way, yeah, there's a repeat. There sounds like a, a nasty rhyme of a bad song. I didn't want to hear again. Uh, we we have this um, um, th these battles over, um, you know, we're, we're we're looking right now. Georgia um, has passed some laws. Other states are trying to pass. Yeah. You know, they want to say, they want to call them, you know, basically... Um, He just wanted 11,000 votes. Right. You want, want, want to correct the problems. Well, there wasn't any problem, according to your yeah. own people last night. What are you trying to correct? And we're fearing is, are we looking at a, a Jim Crow-like um, 
legislation again? Are we looking at any way you can think of to, with a smiling face, restrict voting? You don't yeah. want to look like you're restricting voting, but you want to restrict voting. Yeah. Were you worried that Trump was going to destroy democracy already? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. That's uh, a lot of us were worried about that one. <laughs> um, even those who might be um, on the Republican side were worried about that one because, um, you know, well, you know, Europe has, you know, each of your countries, you, you guys have many par multiple parties. Yeah. You, know, you grew up with that one. In the United States, we evolved believing that we should never have political parties. George Washington was so strong. He says he opposed the idea of parties. And before he was done the second term, we had parties. You know? yeah. <laughs> he must have been so freaking upset. You know? <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah, we, he was. Um, he was not a calm gentleman when he got upset, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there was, he, you could see, this is not going to work. Dear heaven, this is not going to yeah. work. You know, he could see the problem with parties because you start lumping together into a tribe. And once you're in a party, it's really hard to compromise with those other people because you're calling them the other. Yeah. You know, that's them, that's not us. And as soon as you say that, you have limited ability. Now, in Europe, you have to, you know, you have an election and all the parties are running and all the parties get a piece of that pie. And so whoever wins the election still has to compromise. You have to compromise. In the US, see, we, it, since we had never planned on a party, it just evolved in a completely haphazard way yeah and it's always win or loser win or lose all or nothing so really you have up or down one part of the other we never have a third fourth or fifth party when if you surveyed people you might yeah. find six parties but we still only have two so everybody so, calls themselves an independent <laughs> yeah. so so we talked a little bit about this but i want to go more in depth of okay, it. No. so You've mentioned that there's public and academic history, but yeah. what mm -hmm. when you finish your let's say PhD or master, what what jobs are available for an historian in today's, in today's world? Market, so precious little. Um, is it is it difficult I, to get a job as a historian? Once tremendously you... difficult. Um, uh, you can become a senator easier. I think you can become a uh, <laughs> historian um, because the nature of universities has been to commercialize. We have commodified all education. It's turned into a commodity, a, a business. Um, I nearly cussed out a trustee who wanted to make the museum more like a business because I said that it's not that we, it is much more of a mission. We have a different way of looking at things. Yes, there are commercial things. I have to keep the budget. I have to think, you know, fiscally responsible and how do I maintain health fiscally, you know, but that's about, that's the limit. Um, yeah. What is my great goal? And the historian is to, um, to look at the past, to construct and build understandings of the past. And involve, yeah. and we use the word conversation a lot. Um, it took me years to really grasp this. I don't always like it, but I think it's the works because historians from age to age have, have talked over the same thing. There's no one set book. You cannot write about the history of World War II and be done because each generation is going to be re-looking at this thing. And because the circumstance changes, there's going to be a different emphasis that they need to hear. Yeah. Whether it be in our age, we need to hear why did the German people succumb to the Nazi regime? Why did they say, that sounds like a good idea? What about the... Um, that party, the Nazi party, sounded good to people yeah. in the 1930s. What were you thinking? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going that. what were you thinking, dude? So right now, we probably need to hear that lesson. Even more than others, we need to hear something like that. What were you thinking? Um, and that's why history will constantly be going over again and again. Also, as we hit the evidences, but the jobs, um, teaching is your primary one. And all of us, in some, some fall, sooner or later, you'll end up teaching. It's kind of, that's kind of the fallback. Yeah. Now, teaching might mean um, I, I've taught everything from kindergarten up through graduate. <laughs> I've, uh, and I'm not a good kindergarten teacher. I'll test you right now. I love <laughs> kindergartners. They're dear. They're wonderful. But heaven help me, I'm not good at it. Mm -hmm. I praise my daughter, who is a wonderful early elementary teacher. She has the 
voice of a yeah. severe mom, but loving mom, you know, don't mess with her. Yeah. Um, I, I, I follow this one lady through, she was a veteran teacher for like 40 years. Man, she was good. And the kids loved How to be patient too. Yeah, th but th there was this ambiance, almost an aura around you. The kids gravitate to you and they know, don't mess with Miss so-and-so, Miss so-and-so, okay? Yeah. Just, you know, but you know this, and they understand how to organize the kids for the concrete learning. Yeah. Um, when I get to middle school, I love middle schoolers. The irascible, bizarre, sixth and seventh grade, I love that age. I That's where your curiosity want... develop as well, right? That's it when is. you get more and, curious. And think, my theory is that for a teacher, and in any, any subject matter, doesn't matter, the teacher teaches best, probably, at the age which they themselves first learned to love education. Yeah. Whether it be college, high school, middle school, grade school. And I found I've interviewed teachers, dozens and dozens of teachers. And I swear, and that, that has been their eyes light up. And say, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You know. And yeah. that was the age they think back themselves. Um, history is similar to this. What history should I study? What fires you up? One yeah. of my dear professors in my graduate doctoral course, Dr. Linda Borsch. Now, she was Jewish a woman and athlete. All right. That was her background. She Interesting tennis. combination. Yeah. 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 Um, what did she teach? Gender studies, reform movements, religion, <laughs> and sports. Right. History. <laughs> and of course. she got really <laughs> giggly about women's sports. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that makes sense. Now, um, I can't remember which the Greek philosophers or historian said, you know, you can't write about military history unless you served in the military. Why? Now, in many ways, there's it helps, but also it hurts because military has a certain way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. I've read sense. a lot of military studies by military people. I go, hmm, <laughs> you're missing something, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is the conversation history. But then again, Sun Tzu was a military man as well, wasn't he? And he wrote about yeah. military history. And, and, and the thing is, you will grasp something that I can't. You know, I've never been to boot camp. Yeah. I've been to summer camp, which I hated, <laughs> but it's not the same thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, although at my summer camp, um, our camp counselor was a was an army boots was an army boot camp sergeant, um, and yes, he did drill us. <laughs> oh. Sixth grade being drilled by boot camp. <laughs> I hated summer camp. Let me tell you right now. Anyway, <laughs> um, off the topic. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. But. Um, so the historian takes their own experiences and they bring them forward. And then you add those experiences. Um, my big value was because um, my dad, mom had vacation time. We traveled. We traveled yeah. to Scotland and England when I was a kid. We went to Mexico. I spent 10, um, I spent my first 10 summers in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, all, I've been, uh, by the time I was in high school, I'd been to 47, 48 states in the Union. So I had seen things. I had hiked, I had seen- I can um, imagine. I, so I traveled extensively. So um, a lot of my uh, history dove into geography as, as, as how I thought framed the questions I was looking at. When yeah. I looked at an event, I looked at the spaces it took place in. You know, if I was at um, a battlefield, I, or I, talking about a, a war, a conflict, I was looking at the field. I would look at, well, that's not such a big hill, you know. Uh, then I climb, oh, yeah, it is a big hill, you know. <laughs> yep. You know, I would play with the space and it would make sense to me. Um, I had an emotional overload, first time I visited Edinburgh Castle in Scotland. You know, I've known that place uh, in, in memory and story since my earliest childhood. To see it for the first time, Oh, now I feel what this feels like. What does this castle yeah. feel like? You feel the history, when, like you said, you, you feel, feel the history, yeah. the history when you touch the walls yeah. and you walk inside. Mm -hmm. And that helps your writing. That helps your storytelling, which is why museum guides make, I think, make really good teachers. Because you're used to telling stories that don't have to be listened to. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, my, my students laughed at me one time. I said, Mr. Mackey, are you sure you weren't a stand-up stand -up comic in another life? Because no, trust me, I was not a stand-up comic. I can't do that. <laughs> right. I may be a goof, but I'm not a stand-up comic. <laughs> yeah. But uh, 
yeah, how do, we talked a little bit about this. So as I said, it must be a currently exciting time to be a, be a historian. I was about to say comedian, but historian. <laughs> and uh, so how do you document modern history like as a historian? Like right now during yeah. COVID-19, how do you document this? Right now, well, what some of my colleagues have done, in fact, um, just before it hit, I told my students this, and I remembered, I think it was Heather Cox Richardson from Boston College, and she's got a um, Letters from an American. She's doing a broad podcast and letter. Oh, she's doing a wonderful job. This is a, this is a tenured faculty. All of a sudden, it's different. If she's politics. interested, I would like to have her on the podcast oh, as yeah. well. Yeah, oh, if you can, be wonderful. She is, she is absolutely, I, I, I've followed her a lot. Uh, but anyway, she has um, encouraged us, just write your own journals and put it in writing because we don't, you know, internet and and electronic may not always be there. Physical things are more are more tactile. They hang hang on hang on better. Um, yeah. So you're writing a journal because you track what you remember day by day by day. Because what happens is, how do I know about the Constitutional Convention when that was a new thing? Because yeah. Madison kept notes, and then there were a few folks who secretly kept their own diaries. You know, in a so you keep track of these things. And there are those who witness this, as well as newspapers and whatnot, but you have those pieces um, and you document it through that one. The electronic world is really tough because it's so blessed fleeting. And it's hard to, you know, so you have the Wayback Machine, which tracks, but even that's gonna be overloaded. You can't just have everything. So um, our own observations are, are priceless. As you go through the day, watch what's going on, read what's going on. Yeah. And then take your own notes. Do you pay extra? Do you pay extra attention to the news pay and everything attention else? Attention to what's going on each day. What is happening? What catches your attention? The historian, yeah. in a century or two, will have hopefully all of our diaries together, and you start looking at oh, 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 you know, well, Matt, yeah. he was oh, he wasn't even paying attention that day. <laughs> he yeah. was playing Fallout all day. He wasn't doing yeah. anything, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a silly goose. But maybe on Tuesday, oh, he was feeling depressed. He watched too much news that day. He was, yeah. you know. So, and that's what we do, but that's later on. You just, you, you preserve what you have. You comment about it. And the historians, and they say, look, historians are terrible fortune tellers. We're always in the rear view mirror. That's what, that's what I want. You say you're terrible fortune tellers, but I want to ask, what do you, how do you think historians, let's say 100 years from now, will look back on 2020 and 2021? This will be a very fun year to study. This will be, a, I mean, there will be dissertations on this year. I get news for you right now uh, because it will be a fabulously fun year to look at. So, oh my God, did you hear what Trump said this day? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's going to be, you know, uh, if YouTube and others that have all these videos recorded, and they're at their, at their stable in a couple of centuries. Um, you will have people just diving through deep dives through um, uh, getting messages. You know, right now, you know, we can do lit searches on newspapers using word text. Well, in the future, you know, we'll be able to do the same thing with video as well. You say, okay, how many times did Trump mention pick a word? Mexican. <laughs> yeah, Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> oh my, my head's already hurting. <laughs> yeah. So you have this um, this deep dive into the into the work, and you start quantitatively going through all this material. Yeah. And then. Because Trump himself is is an incredible case study. I can't oh imagine. Oh my gosh. I mean, he's given comedians a whole new career. Yeah. Um, and that itself will also be part of the of the study. Yeah. Um. No, see, he meant history, not, basically. Yeah, yeah, we've not really had, what we've gone through is, okay, which presidents were ce celebratory, celebratory. Yeah. Reagan was a celebrity in his younger years. He had been an actor. Yeah. And so you, never, so you knew if the guy was lying, you couldn't tell because he was a very good liar. Yeah. He was an actor. You know, he would look completely coherent. Yeah. Speaking. Um, Somebody who's an actor is not to be trusted. <laughs> My apologies to all actors. I just insulted the whole body of people. <laughs> but um, you're skilled at presenting yourself in a certain way. Yeah. You can, okay, this character, this day, today I'm going to be the tough warlord kind of persona, and I'm going to put this on, and I have this actor 
voice. Um, I do that when I met in class. I have a certain voice I use with, with, with students. So, you think um, students would be surprised when they hear your voice in this podcast? That is something different. No, they, they know me. Yeah, my, my college <laughs> students know me. When I taught high school, I had to be different. Yeah. I, I, my, 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 one year I taught, um, oh, it was, it was second grade, which is hard for me anyway. And to get kind of context, um, I all summer, I at our vacation Bible school at our church, and was a huge, we had, you know, 200 kids at this, this event all, all week long. And I was the comic relief. Yeah. All right. It was a skit I would do every morning. Um, and, it, and I had, it was very slapstick. All right. Absolutely Laurel and Hardy type slapstick. And I had kids laughing and roaring and, you know, yeah. I did it all week long. So I was the Claude, the Claudite kid. And um, here he is early from the second week of school. The kids are getting acclimated. They have not really been trained yet. I'm a sub. And I hear two kids yell out, it's the Klondike kid. I go, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> These kids have already associated me with a goof. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is not good. <laughs> um, you know, so the, you know, there's, a, there's, there's the context uh, of the event here. Um, you know, you have, you have that voice. And, and politicians have a certain image that they want to portray. The historian needs to dive behind that image to kind of find out what's you know, what's behind that. You know, Lincoln was that way. You say Lincoln, we died behind his his words. Yeah. Now we talked about how he would laugh in the previous yeah, podcast. Would, and... But we realized with him that he wrote his own speeches and he was his own editor. So you can take Lincoln's words a little more seriously than a president in today. Yeah. Now, um, most modern presidents have a speech writers. Kennedy had speech writers. Yeah. Sorensen was Kennedy's speech writer. You know, you had these... Um, I mean, yeah, you can clear, Trump. you can clearly hear here when Trump wrote his own speech versus right. when somebody wrote yeah. it for him. It's like after the invasion of the Capitol, you can yeah. hear if somebody now, wrote yeah. it for him and before yeah. that he wrote the speech really himself. Don't know. Now with Trump, you obviously knew he, no one wrote that speech. You know, yeah. <laughs> nobody wrote nothing, <laughs> including him. But it's the just, apologize speech, somebody clearly wrote that apologize speech for him. Yeah. That's, that's not his own words. Oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. You, you can spot the voice. You know that when, you know, ranting off the top of your head. Yeah. Lincoln hated doing that because he knew he would say something dumb. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, he was careful. He understood the rule. Don't tell everything you know. Um, so, you know, the historian's job is to dig behind that one and to kind of, you know, egg out a story or eke out a story that um, one that makes sense. And of course, the next history is going to come along and look at it and go, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. And, you know, have a different take on it over the years. Yeah. Um, Which kind of brings me to the next question. It's a two-part question, if you will. And how, the, how did a document historian from, like, let's say, a thousand years ago, let's say in the beginning of uh, the Ottoman Empire, and say okay. document history. Did you to use that as an example? Right. And how okay. and how can we say that this story is this is how it happened? That is mm. actually right. because as you know, history is written by the victor. But how can we say that this actually happened the way yeah. that it, we think it happened? All right, keep me on. I'll keep me on focus here. I want to. I need your help. Because uh, I'll, I'll I will wander off into Lord yeah. knows what rabbit hole. No, but not like just general <laughs> and any historians yeah. just right. and a historian. How can we say that this happened? And right, the, no, the no, way no, that, that, that's, the, that's one of the most valid questions you've got. My favorite, and it's not really it's pre auto it's late Roman Eusebius. I love Eusebius because he is a historian. He is an early Christian historian that yeah. had sources available to him that are long gone. All right. The file cabinets, <laughs> you know, of uh, fourth century Byzantium and Rome are gone. We don't have those anymore. They've been burned. Yeah. So we've got his. A lot of the things you look at, and they would write somewhat like chronicles, and they would write in little bits and pieces. The ancients, um, like Thucydides and Herodotus, the founders, what we call history, um, you know, had us. They would open up with what they're trying to do. Take, I think yeah. take them at their word. They're trying to do this. Um, we are limited when we look at really ancient history to what that ancient writer says and then to a newer science called archaeology. Yeah. How does, archaeology 
how does archaeologists and historians work together? Archaeology is not even 200 years old. It's, it's a very new science. Um, and But how do you work evolving. together with archaeologists? Like, do you work um, well together or do you like... You, you need to. Well, depending on the historian. Um, I grew up doing material culture, so it was natural for me to work with archaeology because I dealt with buildings above ground archaeology all the time. Yeah. Um, so dealing with underground archaeology was, was no... It was, I, I, you know, I needed to learn... I needed to read the reports because archaeologists write from an anthropology background, yeah. their training. And so their writing is stunningly muddy, <laughs> really, really muddy writing. And so I hate reading the reports because it's so clever. You know, um, they are not elegant, put it that way. Um, so I, I, have to, I have to wade my way through the findings. They're priceless because, because then I got I to gotta go back through the earlier ones which is also why you have to specialize in this, like first century Rome, third century, you, you really need to specialize because you really have to know the languages. Yeah. I have to be able to read Greek. So you, you have know. to learn nothing in order to understand. Yeah, I have got to, because I got to know the syntax, I got to know context. Um, I mean, yes, I've got a really good copy of Eusebius and I, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a good copy, but I'm still, I don't know the Greek myself. So I, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not, I can't be serious about it. Um, there the languages are essential. Anyway, um, I have to rely so much on those things that I have to kind of match up sources. Okay, so let's say I have Eusebius or Tacitus or Pliny the Elder. I've got, you know, these writers and they've written about the past. They've written about a fairly recent past, so they're not talking about long past. Yeah. Eusebius, I mean, uh, he does talk about the past, but it's only three centuries behind him. Yeah. He's talking about the apostles and he's talking about the church fathers and Clement of Alexandria and he's talking about um, those things. And, but that's within only three centuries away. And even oral history can last that long. Yeah. Particularly that day and age. Even you okay, frozen, like, yeah. you know, this is still a literate culture, but you still have those and there's still records coherently available that Within, you know, within Constantinople, which is long gone. You know, those, there are records. He's a court record. Now, yeah. most writing at that time we call chronicles. And one of the more famous chronicles, of course, of me was uh, Foissars, uh, the Hundred Years' War, Foissars Chronicles, uh, about the Chrysa and Poitiers, the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. Um, his stuff is epic, you know, he, but he writes again fairly recently and he's interviewing the generals and commanders of both armies. But can we be reliable on this source or do we have to you be have skeptic? To kind of take it. Well, it's not, you have to remember, okay, context. When was this written? I have to go back. Okay, it's written only within the lifetime of those who experienced it. So I have to take it with the same grain of salt. I would take a AP News report yeah. or, or maybe even a Fox News versus a BBC or Sky News. Yeah. Okay, the reporter wasn't there, but the reporter interviewed these people. I was uh, there. Yeah, but then also look up, okay, does Fossar have a background? Okay, Fossar was in the military. Fossar is in politics. He is attached to things like this. So he has, um, knowing what his background is, okay, he's close to the action and he's close to the people his whole life who took the action. You know, yeah. so, all right, I can, but you always have a bit of a jaundiced view. Yeah, I, I actually want to punch. bring up a point to this because, you know, yeah. Anna Tronemnos, who's famously the daughter, a badass daughter of Alexios Tronemnos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she wrote the Alexia, and even the historians agree that it's not entirely, it's biased, mm -hmm. it's not entirely correct. So, can we see this in other sources as well? Like, it's not all more or less biased sometimes, mm -hmm. not just well, correct to compare right, well. Anna Tronemnos. Alexia, which I unfortunately haven't read yet, I will. But, you know, just use an example for this, where she is more biased towards her father. Um, mm -hmm. so you, you don't think that people on this side of the field will be more biased uh, writing well, down? You could, well, bi bias is expected, particularly for um, a contemporary source. Uh, and if you read it as a biased source, you know, we still do that. Yeah. Um, if you read Hamilton's letters, in American, back to American history, he is biased toward a certain way of thinking. He's not writing neutrally. He is not even remotely attempting to be neutral. He yeah. is saying, look, we need order. We need to have um, 
fairly limited voting rights. You need to, um, and yet he has an opposition to slavery in the South, you know, so he's a little mixed in the things. Um, he's biased. Jefferson is tremendously biased in his writings. Yeah. So you have to look at him knowing I am reading somebody who is trying to convince somebody else of his time period of something else. And I keep that in mind. Then I have to realize, all right, what's the other side? What's the other conversation? Yeah. So if you're reading this character, you know, the, the ancient the chronicle from one side, this daughter, you know, she is writing from a particular book. Who is she writing to? Yeah. What is her reading? Here's the, the five seats. Context. Yeah. What is the context of this writing? Where is this coming from? Um, what has caused her to write this thing? All right. Yeah. What else is going on? Because this is complex. Now, let's see. This is complex. What are the other forces going on along with this writing? Who is she writing against? Who is she writing for? Yeah. Is she defending? What is she defending? Why is she defending this? So that means, okay, what's the other side? Is there another side here? You know, it's giving me a clue. She, she's a hostile witness to another side. So now I need to look at the other side. Is there another side I need to find? Can I find it? If I yeah. can't find it, I have to, when I do my writing, I got I to think, all right, I'm a foreigner. This is a foreign country. All right. This world you're, you're referring to, this, right, this writer is, this woman, she is yeah. in a foreign country. But literally for me, you know. Yeah. But the past is a foreign country. So I have to realize I'm a visitor. I'm a traveler in a foreign country, and I'm trying to grasp what's going on, and all I've met is her. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> you know, so I know there's something else here. So my yeah. instinct should tell me by the missing spaces, by the what she doesn't say, yeah, or the extreme anger which she's saying something, yeah, what's missing? So you think that as a historian, you should look at from both sides, from both oh, the enemy yeah. and yeah. the... You really need the both sides. You really need both sides. Now, I'm, oh, excuse me, I might feel like I, I, I agree with one side or the other. Yeah. That's okay. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm, you're going to fall into that. But if I don't know what the other side is, yeah, I can't possibly... Like um, you mentioned the... You mentioned the not the German before, and it's yeah. important to take a look at their situation it as well. Because you need to know um, why do they believe feel this way about this? Yeah. Why did all of a sudden, did, did, you know, okay, this anti Jewishness was not new. This was been old. This has been yeah. around. Um, then you realize, okay, I'll go back. And I remember reading um, the peace treaties. I, I got a book on the 1919 Treaty of World War One. Yeah. And after I got through reading, I didn't read too heavily. I was kind of in a hurry. But I looked at the attitudes recorded by this historian on the, the Japanese and German delegates. The Japanese, because they did not get land concessions that they expected. Yeah. The German delegates, because they were forced to sign a treaty which took all the blame themselves. I go, oh, shoot. Now I know why there's World War II. <laughs> yeah. Because you have personally maligned honor and then there's some books i'm reading on on that idea of on national and personal honor those are intertwined um and to deal with that so that's another concept called you know you start looking at i've offended somebody's honor code they're they're you know you, you can't say it's silly yeah. because it's just because it's not your code <laughs> you know yeah you have to know you're reading inside somebody else's mentality and I talked to you about this before, and like outside the outside the podcast, when I was reading John Tolan's *The Rising Sun*, you see that Japanese view when they oh, invaded yeah. China. When they invaded China, they they were cursed by Americans. But it's not really on the British, but it's not really the same as the British did when with Asian colonies and African colonies. So it's oh, basically yeah. the same. So it's you see the bias, yeah, the bias, the the, the hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah, and I think that makes um, moralizing yes, impossible. You cannot, you know, we can't say to, a, I, mean, I mean, for us to argue that we're condemning Guatemalans yeah. from coming, trying to get to the United States when their country is a is, you know, failed state. Almost. Yeah. And yet it's a failed state because of Cold War policies Yeah, in which we were a key player. 
Yeah. You so it's so it's hypocrisy. Um, has, yeah, the historian. See, historians it, it all sometimes makes a pretty dark patriot. Yeah. Because I love the land I'm born in. This is my country. I'm born here. This is yeah. I, I feel loyalty, and yet I am very critical, and very, and and I and I get criticized because I'm not patriotic enough. Mm. I just know, I know what we've done. Yeah, and I know the dirt we've done, but so so that yeah, I know the sins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been kind I, of I'm, I'm feel feel the same way when I was I'm, I'm me on an amateur level, of course, not an academic level, but having looked through history, I, I'm very yeah. kind of start you kind of started the Saddam Hussein, you kind of started Al Qaeda, you kind of started the reason why North Korea is uh, mm. dictatorship <laughs> and every, but so on and so on. You you yeah, started yeah. Cuban cr missile crisis, so when yeah, I've been, things, been really yeah. critical recently mm -hmm. of America as so a nation as well. If you go to because yeah, I've been studying on an on, again on an, on, on the amateur level, but like you still no, no, see. You, 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 See the hypocrisy here, yeah. as what I mentioned doing, before. You, you're, you're doing what I, I always encourage my students and others to do, to keep reading, to keep on, because it is, history is a form of vicarious wisdom. It is, it's a philosophy. It's not a hard science like, like the German yeah. um, uh, von Ranke school tried to develop. Um, it's, it, it is a, it's a philosophy. It's a way of looking at the world and measuring what, it, what is human. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a real... It's a complex piece. I believe it's essential. It's just that it takes a lot of work. Like anything very valuable does, it has not come fast. It is not easily commodified. It's not something that's, as America would say, useful. Yeah. I want it now. It's, no, dude, if you're going to be wise, it takes time. Yeah. And if you're going to be a politician, you really need to be wise. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I would really prefer it, please. I would really, really would prefer it. Yeah. But um, we are impatient as a people. You know, this is something history. Yeah, we're we're patient. You know, if you look at the culture, you know, and so it's hard to be that way. It's hard to pick that wisdom up. Um, but you gotta, yeah, if you're, if you're doing what you. In fact, you are doing a valuable job in practicing public history. Yeah, this is something that um, I keep encouraging folks to do. Um, I just hope I don't keep <laughs> wandering off here on the tangents. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Carry on. But it's it's important to, um, you know, when you're reading. Now, you mentioned earlier to find, how do I know good sources? You know, how do I know yeah. I'm, you know, how, what happened? If you think of history as a conversation, um, quite often, the good sources, you have to know, you have to read a lot. Um, and you start going through a lot of various histories. And, he, and what I've always did, what I always, have always done, is go back over the bibliographies, um, even of the most boring, dragging, you know, yeah. even Wikipedia does this sometimes. They'll actually have the sources on there. Um, I did history day recently. I encourage students says, look, go back into Wikipedia. Don't cite Wikipedia for pity's sakes. You know, that's not your source. Go to the bottom. Where did they, where did the authors who wrote that article use? What did they cite? Yeah. Find, trace those down. And then trace those down, and that's kind of what you do. You, you know, like, like if you go to the library and I pick up a book. Let's say you've been talking about uh, the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. And you shelf read. This is the old-fashioned way. And if you got a, if a decent library, which that many public libraries really have, that kind of collection. But you shelf read, and you go to oh, this art book on Byzantine. That's something else here. This other, and you start just you wade. You're you're, go, you're going swimming in sources, and you're not looking for any you're not an attorney you're not looking for a case yeah you're simply trying to become familiar with the place you try to locate the source you try to locate line. the sources and the only way of doing it is seeing how many sources you can kind of wade through sooner or later as you're swimming in this foreign country you know <laughs> you, you know yeah you don't know the area yet. you don't know the language yet you're trying to get the landscape you have to spend some time there and you're looking at, okay, Norden wrote about the Byzantines and he wrote this one, but where's his, oh, here's his old 19th century scholar, boom, boom, boom. here's Edward Gibbon. Oh, he yeah. hated the Byzantines, you know, why? And you read, you know, you start reading through the classics yeah. you start, and you, you move up date into some modern pieces. Yeah. 
and you look, oh, the, oh, the, and you start seeing the same authors again and again. Then you're starting to look, okay, I know who they're using. And then you start to look at, okay, I know what maybe particular primary source is available in English. Yeah. And then I find, okay, here it is. It's a nice translation. I can start going through it. Um, and then, you know, you, 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 you're waiting through this point and you're starting to see a pattern and you're starting to become familiar with this foreign territory. You kind of know where to look. Yeah. Like it's, this is not, there is no, there is no fast way of doing this. And you've already seen that yourself because you, you know, you kind of play with this, but the, even the, the veteran historian, the one thing we are taught is how to teach ourselves again. You know, I'm an Americanist. I can do re- some things now because I've done it a lot. I don't even think about it anymore, which is why I go back over the five C's again. What is the five C's? Yeah, okay, five C's. I wrote them down for myself because I can remember myself. Change over time, I mean, things do not change. Things not stay the same. Age to age is never the same. Context, what was going around your event, the person? What is the time period? What else is happening? Yeah. What else is going on? Causality. Is there a cause I can trace? Did this cause something else? I'm looking for causes. Contingency. Nothing had to happen necessarily the way it had to happen. There are reasons it did. So I'm looking at what other things could have happened. But that's, that's why what ifs come in here. But also, what did this event spin off of? What, what are the spin offs? Yeah. Here. And that. Finally, it's final season complexity is that it's not that simple. If somebody tells me, um, the pa- in fact, I heard Rush Limbaugh say this, and I realized he is an idiot, or he was an idiot. The past is simply what happened, or the history is simply what happened. I go, oh, I know. No, 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 no. What happened is, you know, no, I, I have, unfortunately, no TARDIS. I can't go back in yeah. the past and watch it. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the good news is there are no weeping angels. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, however, <laughs> however, uh, the past is gone. It is truly gone. I can't repeat it. I need to reconstruct it. And it's complex. It's in yeah. a foreign area, and I have to learn the language or languages. Of that and then I have to follow other guides who've been there before me. Yeah. Um, and that's those are your five C's when you look at what does it take to be a historian. Uh, even if you're not in training, those five C's should always be used because I think if you can integrate those into your readings, um, you know, and learn maybe one of the languages, like you know, um, I barely learned French. Yeah. <laughs> I could read it to an extent where. Okay, I can get through this if I got a dictionary on hand, you know, I, because it's required. Some kind of language is required. Um, my language of architecture and buildings, I'm really good at. That, that was my special. I can really do that one. Um, but if I'm in a foreign territory, I've learned, okay, I learned these five C's. And I'm yeah. studying another world altogether because I've been asked to teach it or I've been asked to do something. Um, I know how to start. And that's what the historian has the advantage is because I've done it once. I know the procedures. I know it's going to be some work. <laughs> I'm faster now that I'm more skilled at it. But I need to go in and start reading. Like, for example, I had one summer I was unemployed. Yeah. And I started said I want to go back over the Byzantines. And I just started dive into the Byzantine history. Yeah. I had like nine, eight, nine books by the end of the fall before my teaching schedule started. Um, where I would read Byzantine art, Byzantine co- politics, culture, the chronology, just so that I could be familiarized myself and I could see, oh, I can see how this fits better, how it fits with Europe, yeah. how it fits with Rome, how, you know, oh, now I know why something is called, that is such a Byzantine structure. I've seen yeah. Byzantine politics. Oh, now I know what you mean. <laughs> it's yeah. un- unduly complex and nasty. <laughs> you know? It's not a flattering expression to use. Yeah. But uh, I was gonna. Ask, so yeah, that was one thing I find I find fascinating about studying history, as we mentioned before, is both 
looking from both sides like what was it like living in and being actually in the german Reich for stuff what was it like to be a normal citizen in ancient rome what was it like being a soldier mm-hmm. etc so i find it interesting to see both of both sides of of history that's one of the reasons i love learning about history well it's, that's that's the value of it though if you're not doing that um um if i'm only promoting a side i'm an activist yeah I'm not acting as a historian. I'm using it. And the danger is using history as a tool of bludgeon. It is false use. Yeah. It's propaganda. And I am deathly opposed to, even if I agree with the point you're using, if this person is using it as a blunt tool, I'm yeah. opposed to it. Because that's no, you're using it wrong. That's not how you use it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, you're using a monkey wrench as a hammer. Stop it. You know, it's not yeah. supposed to be that way. And I think as well, when it comes to, and I'm going to say this, it's kind of related, but I feel like Islam in today's of age is so misunderstood. And, that, and that's one of the reasons I started looking into the Ottoman history and mm-hmm. in, my, in my caliphate empire, because it's really not as not what we think Islam is. And I want to do an episode of its own on this eventually. Yeah. So yes, it is different, right? So that's one of the reasons I was I've been so curious about Ottoman and oh my mm-hmm. and history because it's so fascinating. When you look at the, um, you know, I I, I look because I used to went to school in, in Israel back in the seventies, and um, one of the things we studied and I I I'm kind of discuss it myself because I wasn't interested at the time. I was trying to go back earlier, and here is all this Ottoman architecture all over the place. Yeah. I mean. Jerusalem is an Ottoman city. You know, old Jerusalem is basically an Ottoman city. And it, yeah. it's architecture, it's it's packed with Ottoman architecture. Um Acre um is Crusader, you know, yeah. it's 12th, 15th, 12th, 13th century crusade, you know, European. Yeah. I mean, all this great stuff. And I wasn't really paying attention because I was looking for Roman, you know. Yeah. I was looking for earlier. Um it's, you know, see, it's, I was, but my mind was not trained yet to just look what's around me and yeah. to look at the layers. There are, there are beauties in, in a place like that in, in Jordan or anywhere else yeah. on the ancient Fertile Crescent. It's just, my, the layers are stunning. You know? um, yeah. No wonder archaeologists love this place. You I know what? Yeah. <laughs> 10,000 I... years of layers here. <laughs> yeah. I was also reading as well the first crusade by Peter. Uh, I'm gonna see if I I need I need a phone to see if I can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Peter Frankopan, Peter oh, Frankopan, yeah. and uh, it's interesting to see that Jerusalem was captured almost 90 yeah. years earlier before the crusade as well. Yeah. So it was really well, interesting to see this that the well, crusade was, was 90 years after after yeah, the capture. Yeah, well, we think about the uh, the battling going on here. Um, I was reading when I, when I was reading the Byzantine Empire, maybe Constantinople. Yeah. When you know they really lost, you know, the city-state, the polis, was much larger than the city itself, but they lost what, what we now call Turkey because they had been fighting so long with Parthenia, the, the Persians, yeah. that they were weakened. So by the time the the um, the Abbasids and the Arabs came up, they had already lost so many soldiers. They had already they had not rep- so they were weakened. Yeah. And so you know, you had these interplay of this constant flux of people to this area. And you can't forget there's Mamluks at one time, there's Romans and Mamluks, you know, yeah. they're all over the place. So there's this fascinating groupings that to the American kid that I am, I didn't hear about them as a kid. They, didn't, we didn't, they weren't part of our, you know, I had to pick them up later yeah. on. I feel embarrassed to say, oh, I'm late in life getting to these guys. They're fascinating. <clears throat> um, but that's but then you start bringing that forward. I go through the Ottomans, then through World War One uh, treaties of you know Paris, and then you know World War Two, and then the Cold War. And because well, no wonder it's so screwed up a mess. Shoot, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know there is no way it could be if you start going through time, change over time, and you walk your way from that through this even in a brief sense it gives a better sense of boy this is a mess how did we you know well you know there's a lot of blame to go around but we don't make it any better 
because we keep yeah. trying to find a simple answer to it. We keep trying to ass assume that there is going to be something tidy yeah. about this. And history is the most untidy of all the philosophies. Yeah. So do you, before we go, do you have any, I don't have anything you want to say to people who want to become, aspire to become historians and is uh, 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 advice? You keep asking this. I, uh, if you're looking at it as a profession to work in it, um, the, the schooling that go back, you mentioned earlier, some of the top schools, I went to Western Michigan and I like Western Michigan. Uh, it was an affordable school, but it had good, good faculty and intimate relationships, you know, close with faculty. It was not a big, overly big school and it has a wonderful library. It's not well known except as a medieval course, Western Michigan was wonderful for that. They were top end. Um, the American school was kind of an afterthought. They were, kept, you know, it's trying to keep the program going. Um, they were dominated by ancient and medieval studies. Chicago is a good American program, Harvard, Yale, but those are tremendously expensive programs. Um, those are still your top end schools. Um, um, Brown University is a very, is, is an you know, doctoral school. Um, I, I was odd though. I went into public history first. I did museum studies or historic preservation. And then when on a work, I did teaching, another degree in teaching. Finally, I went back for a PhD because I really felt I needed to be able to do research. I just could not properly do research without some better training. Yeah. And that's why I went for a PhD. I was very mercenary about it. And I was living in Michigan. Western Michigan was affordable. It was nearby. And they were eager to have it because they had, and, and when I was there before, they knew I would finish the program. I was determined to wrap it up. And that was probably my most valuable skill that they found is that I was tenacious. You have to be really, really want to do this. Um, I mean, really, really want to do this. And it's a serious occupation. You have to treat it as serious as any other occupation, even medicine or otherwise, because um, in fact, people don't realize um, people in the PhD programs have spent more time in school than most medical doctors have, or, or attorneys, you know, they, when they use professional degrees. I mean, um, I've spent 17 years in graduate school. That's more than I have spent. This is a long time, dude. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you're constantly, you know, it, it's that constant lifelong learning. This is what I learned as an undergrad, lifelong learning. Um, so either as a professional or even as a, an active amateur. And I hate the word amateur because in our age, we do, not, we do not use the word amateur well. Because even if there is no job in the teaching profession in the university for historians, I would still practice history in some kind of professional fashion. Now I might end up doing it through a museum, through a consortium of historians, like you know, using YouTube as a vehicle of outreach. Yeah. There is so wow. many great YouTube channels out there that yeah. is yeah. definitely re recommend. Maybe, and I think, and I, as I'm thinking, okay, here, here, I, I might be predicting the future. This is dangerous. It's really dangerous. But using vehicles like YouTube, if you have groups of historians who have access, big things, do I have access to primary sources? I mean, good, solid primary sources and secondary sources, not just. Um, the library. I need to be able to go to, to JSTOR or to the journals. I need a, a large, large, and I mean industrial large collection of professional journals that go back a hundred years. I have yeah. to be able to have access to that one. I need access to primary sources. Now, the Wayback Machine, Internet Archives is a wonderful source for that one. That gets me, um, I'm doing it using it right now for my Lincoln studies more. I'm going back over digging out early 19th, 20th century um, museum brochures and, and literature that I don't have access physically to right now. Yeah. Um, so a, a rare books that public libraries just not gonna have. They, no, no public library has this kind of stuff. So I need access and that's where the gateway is the problem. Universities own the J store. And unless you have a very expensive, very expensive subscription, you can't try, it's hard to get access to it. The, uh, you need to belong to or like, like the Organization of American Historians or the American Historical Association here in the United States. 
some kind of professional body of historians. And a lot of them actually have memberships for those not practicing in the profession. Because more one, they want members. Two, they know that if you join up, one, you support the thing, but also you're going to help promote the practice of history throughout yeah. society. And that is what, what's changed in my period, in my time. When I was in my 20s, public history was a dirty word. If you were a public historian, it means you were unemployable and you were third rate. Now it simply means I'm going to use my professional standing best I can to, in, to inform the politics, the social world of the past. I'm going to use history as my way of wrestling with the great world of problems. So right. history becomes my way of looking at the present. It's my tool. Um, I, I don't do biology. <laughs> you know, I don't do botany. And Lord knows I don't do math. <laughs> I do history. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I use that as my tool to reach out and actually make it, hopefully make a difference in how people look at the present right now. Yeah. So do you, before we go again, do you have anything you wish to promote? Anything you wanted to put in a description? Promote, and, it's so, uh, and it's social media where people can find oh, you if they've got any questions. I don't have, I'm not on anything. Um, I do, I am on LinkedIn. Um, Kitty Mac, yeah, on LinkedIn. Um, I have a professional pattern there and I do uh, con communicate with folks on LinkedIn. Um, I, that's been kind of my thing. I don't, I belong to um, so, so several, several agencies, but as far as my connections, um, Twitter and LinkedIn are, are my are my prime professional outlets. And I'm finding those very helpful to actually keep track of other and other writers. So if you're on like LinkedIn or, or Twitter particularly, um, uh, Twitter Storians is a great handle to follow on Twitter. Twitter Storians is a whole bunch of really high end, wonderfully funny, and actually, and I, I laugh with my gosh, these, these folks are so young, <laughs> I feel so old. But these are up and coming historians, a whole bunch, of, and they just love chatting with people. So Twitter historians, a handle on Twitter, uh, has been a wonderful vehicle for just grabbing a hold of new historians, um, younger historians who are writing, getting books out, and you're, you're in, um, and you, you can, get signed books that way you can get, you know, you can get informed because they're all, they're all over the spectrum. They're all over the spectrum here. And they're very active um, in social media. And that would help anybody looking to kind of just get my foot in the door. How do I get to know people um, if I can't afford school? I've got a decent degree. I've got, you know, an interest. Yeah. You know, start with that and keep pursuing that one. Um, you don't need to do it all in one fell swoop. I, I, I took my entire life. I only got my PhD was this before I turned 60. Hmm. So I'm with, uh, I was by far the oldest student there. <laughs> I was holding the professors. Yeah. But, um, but I also had to learn to respect people younger than me and follow people younger than me because I knew they had experience that I didn't have yet. Um, being open to that and yet being critical at the same time is a real life skill yeah in this in this occupation thank you so much for coming back and uh, you're welcome. i hope i was useful this time <laughs> definitely you're always useful and uh, you're welcome back anytime if you liked this episode check out some of the previous episodes we've done you're definitely gonna find something you like definitely check out episode 14 where, where thomas mackie is uh, or for, or on for the first time on his podcast i'm sure he will be back eventually <laughs> this has been well that age well. We have, you can find us on Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts. We are also on Stereo, where you can where we do exclusive interviews that is only available on the app Stereo. Tomorrow we will discuss. The, uh, no, it, it's not tomorrow, but it. I mean, I'm sorry. That was, uh, so this uh, we will we will discuss the. Yeah or have by this point, I suppose, this just the Zack Snyder's Justice League. Well, that came out famously, women, this is just a drama. We would do uh, not just historian, but it, any kind of people from escaping or troll to comedians, whoever you name it, I would definitely get them there. 
So definitely check us out there as well. This has been World Done H12. I'll see you next time. My name is Alan. Thank you for listening.